because of our conversation today is going to be about chapters 22, <laughs> chapters 23, chapter 26 in your textbook, The American Pageant, right? Now, um, first thing that we talked about, and that there'll be questions on the test, is the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, we identified a number of things that were true about the country and in particular about the South. We said that in the immediate aftermath of the war, there were several questions that had to be answered. One was this. Is your mic on? That's the first question. <laughs> in the immediate aftermath, in the immediate aftermath of the war, <laughs> I don't think so. In the immediate aftermath, in the immediate aftermath, in the immediate aftermath, there it is. All right, Gary, now we got it. So in the immediate aftermath of the war, one question was, what would become of the ex-Confederates? So what are we going to do with the people who broke away, declared themselves independent, and were considered responsible for the war. So what's going to become of them? Now one thing that we know about the ex-Confederates, and we know that this plays out later in, in Reconstruction, the ex-Confederates, the people that participated in the insurrection, are definitely not sorry. Right? They are not sorry about what transpired. They are not apologetic, and in some ways they are defiant. That's question one. Question two was, um, how would we rebuild the, the destroyed South? I mean, how would we rebuild it economically? You know, how would it be rebuilt in terms of infrastructure? How would that occur? Thirdly, we said, you know, the question was, how would these states be reincorporated into the Union? Readmitted, reincorporated, restored to the Union, and those terms all meant something. Fourthly, and maybe most importantly, what would become of the former slaves? Four million people were enslaved prior to the Civil War. During the war, countless slaves, you know, escaped the Union lines and, and earned their freedom. Other slaves were emancipated as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation. And finally, all slaves were liberated as a result of the 13th Amendment. Now, with slavery abolished, what will become of these people? <coughs> now, let me ask you this question at this juncture. We didn't really talk about it at this juncture. If we were to pick one thing that represented the immediate northern response to that question, what will become of the, of the four million ex-slaves? The immediate and tangible response of the North to that question is in the form of what? What do they do? Go ahead, Antonio. Uh, 14th Amendment. Well, pardon me, the 14th Amendment. I, I think that's a good response. I mean, but I, I, was, I, I think maybe I'm answering, asking this question in a way it's not getting, getting the answer that I want. I mean, I think that's, that's a legitimate. But I'm talking about immediate and tangible. What do we do about them being hungry? What do we do about them getting a job? You, you know where I'm going? The Freedmen's Bureau. Tell me about, Juliet, dear, do, tell me, dear Juliet, about the Freedmen's Bureau. What do you recall of it? Um, that was the first national relief agency. Ah, that's a wonderful thing. Did I say that? The first <laughs> national relief agency. What a wonderful thing. Yes, it is a, it's, it's kind of like a disaster, it's a national agency, uh, a bureau that is committed to kind of addressing a disaster, which is the Civil War. And the Freedmen's Bureau was this federal government agency that hired agents to go down into the South and to help to facilitate the, trans the transition of the slaves from slavery to freedom. What the Freedmen's Bureau is best known for is education. Freedmen's Bureau workers built and staffed schools. African Americans went to schools in large numbers. Now remember, I, I don't know if I said this in every, other, in every class, but if I'm a freed slave and I observe the difference between me as a slave 
and my white owners and other white people. The difference was those white people owned property and had education. So it's only going to be natural that the ex-slaves are going to seek both of those things, to own property and to become educated. It's only natural. Now, what did the white South think of the, um, the Freedmen's Bureau? To go off the subject. Go ahead, Joel. They didn't like it. They were mad at it. Why, why does the white South resent the Freedmen's Bureau? Because the blacks like stole from the whites and stuff. So, and they just didn't like the blacks in general. So something that helped them is... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think part of it is racial prejudice, sure. But go ahead, Jason. Do they want to use the slaves in their own way? Yes, I mean, I think what Jason said, and I, and I think this becomes evident with the white response to the Freedmen's Bureau, that the white South is going to maintain from the very end of the Civil War that we will choke down emancipation. We will accept the emancipation of our slaves, albeit unwillingly, but we lost. But the status and condition of the freed slaves is our business. And they are going to try to assert that. And as they try to assert that, there's going to be conflict, but eventually they're going to win. Right? They're, they're going to win. Now, okay, a fifth question is going to be who's going to, to um, be in charge of this, the president or Congress. And what we know is the first, the first um, um, part of government to address Reconstruction is the president and is Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln presents his 10% plan. December of 1863, the purpose of the proposal was to restore in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee loyal governments. So that was the purpose of the proposal. Okay, Louisiana, here's what you must do in order to reconstitute yourselves as a loyal state as a part of the Union. The reason those states were selected is they were under Union military control. The Confederates were defeated in those states. Their state governments, the Confederate state governments had crumbled. The Union was in control. Now, what do you remember as being noteworthy about Lincoln's death. What do you remember, if anything? Uh, go ahead, Haley. Go, go ahead. Um, all the southerners would be pardoned? Yes. It's, you could call it this, Luke, and you are correct. Lincoln's 10% plan uh, issued blanket amnesty for everyone but whom? High Highest ranking officials. Then, what percentage of people had to take the oath of allegiance? before the, the, a new state government could be formed. Go, Jason. 10%. Hence the 10% plan. Now, remember we argued that Lincoln's 10% plan was considered to be heavily leaning towards healing. Quick restoration of ex-Confederate states, you know, rapid restoration of their, of their governments, healing. Now, what group within the Republican Party resisted Lincoln's uh, attempts? Go ahead, Joel. The radical Republicans. The radical Republicans. Marissa, tell me what you remember about radical Republicans. What do you call? Do you, what do you recall them, dear Marissa? Anything. Anything. <laughs> you should, uh, your your ex friend Antonio will help you. Yes. Well, Lincoln wanted your name. Yes. What Antonio said, if you didn't hear him, he said, well, while Lincoln kind of swung towards healing, the radical Republicans wanted justice. A new, what would that justice take the form of for radical Republicans? What did they want to see happen in, in the South as a result of a presidential or congressional program? Go ahead, dear Anu. Pardon me, I said it again. Yeah, I mean, yes, they want to get rid of corruption. But what did they want to do with the slaves and the southerners? Do you know what I mean, Shane? Go ahead. Say it. Say it. Do it. You can do it. Well, the slaves are free. Punish the southerners. They want to punish them. 
Right? They want to punish them. They want to destroy the former leadership class. They want to, to enfranchise the slaves. They want to build a new political coalition that would rule the South, that would undermine the former leadership class. What was the name of their counter proposal? Go ahead, Joel. Wade Davis. Wade Davis. So Wade Davis, Antonio, leans towards justice. Hey, Haley, do you recall what happened to the Wayne Davis bill? It, it, it passes both houses of Congress, but it is, does not come into law. Why not? Uh, President law allows it to die in pocket veto. Now, eventually, well, okay, Lincoln and the radicals are going to differ over Reconstruction. Those differences are going to be there. I was reading them. Now I take that class and I tell you about it, right? You kids don't care, but I take it and I tell you about it. And so part of that class is I had to read Lincoln's last address, his last public address. So I'm reading it. It's very brief and it's interesting. All he talks about is his 10% plan in Louisiana, defending it. Apparently, Louisiana is the first state to fully embrace it, and there was some criticism of it. And Lincoln is defending it. The last thing that he does before his, his death, his last public address, is defending his 10% plan and how it played out in Louisiana and making a systematic case in support of it. So even upon his death, this issue is unresolved. Now, here's a question. How was Johnson's proposal for Reconstruction different than Lincoln's? Both are considered to be a part of what we call presidential reconstruction. Does anybody remember anything at all? Coulter, do you recall anything at all? Blast it. Go ahead, Luke. Doesn't Johnson's target the class? Yes. There isn't much difference between Lincoln and Johnson's plan. One of the only differences is that Johnson's plan did not give amnesty in a blanket manner to everyone. People that owned $20,000 worth of property had to petition him personally. But he grants very liberal pardons. Now, we know this, that under presidential reconstruction, Lincoln, Johnson, right, all 11 ex-Confederate states had complied with what they had been required to do by December of 1865. So Reconstruction would have been complete. The last thing that had to, to, to occur was that Congress had to allow newly elected um, senators and congressmen from these newly re reconstructed states to take their seats in Congress. We know this. Congress refuses to do that in December of 65. We offered two reasons why. Um, do any of the vicars, do, do, do the vicars know why? Two reasons, we said, dear vicars. One, can you pick one reason why Congress rejected Reconstruction under presidential terms? Go ahead. Yes, if, Danielle, right? Dominique. Dominique. If you didn't hear Dominique, what Dominique said was, that, that, that when, when offered the opportunity to elect people to office, many ex-Confederate generals and office holders were elected by these newly reconstructed states, which seemed insulting. It was evidence of what we said initially. The South was not sorry, and they weren't sorry. So they elected the same people, and those people defiantly came to take their seats. What was the other thing? There was another thing that the, the North resented. Does anyone recall, recall besides Jason and myself? Go ahead, Jason, tell the kids. Boston. Uh, uh, go ahead, Julia. It has the black codes. Yes, the black codes. Are the black codes the same thing as Jim Crow laws? Yes. We mentioned Jim Crow laws the other day. Are the black codes and Jim Crow laws the same thing? Shane, is that true? Mm -hmm. They are not. What's the difference? What's the difference between the Black Codes and the Jim Crow laws? What were the Black Codes intended to do? They were passed in that time period of, of presidential reconstruction. Go ahead. They wanted to give the Blacks secondary citizenship? Yes. They established a second-class citizenship for African Americans under presidential reconstruction. What did Jim Crow laws do? Now, you could argue 
the Jim Crow laws did something similar. But Jim Crow laws were passed after Reconstruction was over in order to do what? Do you recall? Andrew? No? It's not Andrew. Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you recall? Ian. Uh, uh, do you recall Ian? Jim, um, uh, Jim Crow laws. What did they do? This is later. Go ahead. Separated. Yes, segregation. They, they, they established legal segregation. Good. Now, um, after Congress refuses to recognize the Confederate States under the Johnson slash Lincoln plan, there is a battle between Congress and Johnson over Reconstruction. Now, this battle we didn't talk about, or we talked about in different levels, because we just skipped over it, right? But let me give you the highlights of the battle. The highlights of the battle are that Congress rejects presidential reconstruction and then passes a renewal of the Freedmen's Bureau and a Civil Rights Act, right? So in the early spring and the late winter of 66, yes, late winter of 66, Congress says, okay, we don't like presidential reconstruction, so we're going to renew the Freedmen's Bureau and we're going to pass a Civil Rights Act that protects the freedoms of African Americans. Johnson vetoes both of these things. Then Congress overrides both of Johnson's vetoes. But they are fearful that a new Congress might be elected and just simply pass new legislation. So they seek to constitutionalize, which I'm not sure that's a word for the viewers at home, but let's just say that it is. They seek to constitutionalize their vision of Reconstruction by passing the 14th Amendment. In June of 1866, the House and the Senate, by two-thirds majority, passed the 14th Amendment. They pass it along to the states, and they tell the states, encourage states to ratify it. They tell the ex-Confederate states that we won't accept you into the Union unless you ratify and live by the 14th Amendment. Johnson encourages the ex-Confederate states to not do that. Right? Johnson says, don't do it. Don't ratify it. Congress says, if you don't ratify it, you're not back in. What state ratified? We said this, remember, it's just trivia, not important. For the viewers at home, we don't do this trivia all the time. Yes? Tennessee. Tennessee. The other 10 states refuse. Now, we would have said this if we had class in the normal schedule, but we would have said, why well, look, what breaks this impasse? Well, what breaks the impasse between Johnson and the radicals is the congressional elections of 66. Johnson is going to actively campaign for candidates who want Reconstruction to be aligned with healing and presidential reconstruction. The radicals are going to campaign for candidates that want reconstruction consistent with justice and leaning more towards the way Davis did. When the votes are tallied, the Republicans win supermajorities in both the House and the Senate. So what they do then is when they convene this new Congress, they throw out all of, of presidential reconstruction and usher in congressional reconstruction, correct? First, second, and third reconstruction acts, tenure of office act, congressional reconstruction. Now, congressional reconstruction is going to be implemented Right? after Congress passes this legislation by Andrew Johnson. Johnson, remember, is reluctant to do this. And so Congress is going to battle with Johnson 
over Reconstruction, and that battle is going to result in Johnson's impeachment, his trial, but not his conviction. But even though Johnson is not convicted of a high crime misdemeanor, and oh, by the way, Anu, what piece of legislation was Johnson accused of violating, and he admitted that he had done so? They're coming with a, they're coming with a consensus answer. Sonny, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, come with a consensus answer. Ask the Vickers. The Vickers, no. Dominique knows. Go ahead, Dominique, help your friends. The Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Oh, what cabinet member, Juliet, what cabinet member did Johnson fire in violation of the Tenure of Office Act? The Secretary of War. That's right. Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War. That's who he fired. And so it was that that resulted in his impeachment, but not his conviction. But remember, part of the kind of arrangement that leads to Johnson not being convicted is that Johnson agrees to back down. So, you know, and then we said subsequently, Grant is elected to the presidency. When Grant is elected to the presidency um, and Congress is under the control of the Republicans, they attempt to implement radical re or congressional reconstruction. Now, one of the things that we used to say when we covered everything, and we didn't cover everything here, is that radical reconstruction or congressional reconstruction meant that um, the South, the, the, the defeated South, would be um, reconstructed and governments, Republican governments would be created that would enforce the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment, remember this, the 14th Amendment defined citizenship as anyone born on U.S. soil or naturalized, and assured that citizens were entitled to equal protection under the law. So it basically mandated that states provide for citizens equal protection under the law. Now, the governments that were created to implement this, the radical regimes as they were called, were made up of a coalition of three groups, carpetbaggers, scallywags, and free slaves. Now, we know who the free slaves are, but we didn't define carpetbaggers and scallywags quickly to do that. This is on the test, a treat for you 10, and who might watch this at their houses, right? I, I did receive an email from two girls from Texas last night saying that they had watched the review sessions all last year and had done well on the AP test and wanted to, to, to drop me a line of appreciation. There you go. There you go. Right there you go. So out there in Texas, tall talking Texas, they are clicking on our review sessions and enjoying success. Who knows who will watch this? I bet you Obama right now is going, he's going through there thinking, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Uh, yeah so, so, so back to the topic at hand. Carpetbaggers were northerners who came south after the war. Northerners who came south after the war were called carpetbaggers. That meant that they took all their possessions and put it in a carpet bag, carpet bag and came to the South to take advantage of white Southerners. That's what white Southerners thought. They hated the carpetbaggers. Scallywags were white Southerners who embraced the Republican government. So I'm a white Southerner. Most white Southerners hated the new regimes, resisted it, supported the Ku Klux Klan, fought it with everything they could. But some white Southerners supported them. The most famous scallywag was, um, who was the general that advised Lee not to attack at Gettysburg? Oh, what was his name? Um, Longstreet, yes, thanks. Longstreet. Longstreet became a Republican after the war. You think the ex-Confederates were mad? I mean, they were really mad at Longstreet. I mean, this was like the worst thing you could do, would be embrace the Republican Party and Longstreet did. Okay, coalitions of those three groups are going to form the basis of these governments. Now, we know this. We know that these governments had a mixed record. 
you know, that, that, that the, the, some of the, the, the reconstruction, the radical reconstruction governments were corrupt, others were not, you know, that they accomplished great things at times and they pushed the South forward, but they raised taxes and there was corruption and there was mismanagement and there were problems and there was accusations and there was controversy. The Ku Klux Klan is going to lead the Southern response to these radical regimes. Now, we said, you know, the Ku Klux Klan can really best be described as a terrorist organization. I mean, that's what terrorists do. They try to intimidate people from, from doing things you know, from, from executing things. Now, we know also that at first, the federal government fought the Ku Klux Klan and attempted to implement radical reconstruction. But eventually, right, eventually, um, the national government is going to, the public opinion in the North, and we talked about this just the other day, for a variety of reasons, is going to kind of give up on radical reconstruction, surrender. Um, we talked a little bit as we were talking about this about Grant. And one of the things that we said is, you know, the Republicans were optimistic that once they elected Grant, that he would effectively implement congressional reconstruction. And he does. You know, we said that Grant you know, uses the army to crush the Ku Klux Klan with some success. But what hampers Grant, and really what hampers the Republican effort in the South, is this corruption. That Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats tie to radical reconstruction. And we see that in the election of 72. Who does Grant run against in the election of 72? Is in, in this ironic presidential election. Does anybody remember besides the instructor? Go ahead. Greeley, right? Horace Greeley. How, Lucas Haley, do we remember Horace Greeley? We remember him, do we not? We did. Marissa, do you remember Horace Greeley? He's the what? I don't You do not. And who, do you remember Horace Greeley? What did she say? Oh, he was the newspaper editor that wrote that letter to Lincoln challenging his position on slavery, and Lincoln is going to respond to that letter. Greeley was this widely known Republican who had been a vicious opponent of the South, but in, you know, eventually Greeley is going to say, we need to resolve this and move forward, and the Democrats are going to nominate him in 72, ironically. And we said that even though the Democrats nominated him, many Democrats just can't stomach voting for him, and Grant is easily reelected. Oh, what did we say? We said that that, that there was there was a, a, a we weren't going to talk about all the scandals, but one scandal in the Grant administration was was prominent. Do you remember what we mentioned? We didn't describe it at all. No, no, it was Credit Mobilier, the Credit Mobilier scandal. And so you should take a look at that. The election of 72, the Credit Mobilier scandal was, the, was in 73, right? So it wasn't relevant for that election. The, Grant was reelected in 72. Grant was elected at the first time, he was elected the first time in 68 with great enthusiasm. He was reelected the second time fairly handily, but by that time, there had been significant scandals. Credit Mobilier had not occurred until, had not come to light until 73. It was about railroads. It involved railroad contracts. And what did we say finally ends the period that we call radical reconstruction? What is it that finally ends it? Go ahead, Drew. Hayes' election. Hayes' election in, in, in 76. Who does Hayes defeat? Does anybody remember besides the instructor? Anybody remember? Shane, do you recall? Who? Um, Coulter, Matt, Coulter, do you recall? Go ahead, Joel. Tilton. Tilton, right? He defeats Tilton. And his election is going to mark the end of radical reconstruction. 
Well, actually, we say radical reconstruction ends with the compromise of 77. Now, the compromise of 77 is a part of Hayes' election. What's the compromise of 77? What's the compromise? Yes. Hayes Yes, the compromise of 77 is the Democrats allow the Republican votes to be counted for Hayes. Hayes is the president, and in return, he withdraws all troops from the South, which ends Reconstruction. Now, we have pretty much gone through Reconstruction, you know, thoroughly. And then, a little bit, we started to talk today about the politics of the period. And what we said was um, that, that there was widespread voter turnout in, in the presidential elections of this period, but lackluster leaders, you know, issueless elections, and widespread corruption. And we offered some explanations as to why. And we said political parity was one of the reasons that there was so much interest in politics. The Democrats and Republicans were politically kind of equal, and that every election was in play. And so no one, people could believe that their votes counted because the elections were so close. Now, um, because they were so close, neither party liked to take firm stands on issues. And we said that, issueless elections. And we talked a little bit about other reasons, patronage, and we talked about, you know, um, um, emotional issues. What does waving the bloody shirt mean? We mentioned that. Yes, go ahead, Lucas. Yes. Waving the bloody shirt meant that you would blame the Democrats for the Civil War. And the idea that the bloodshed of the Civil War, the Democrats were responsible for doing. Now, besides emotional issues, we talked about cultural issues that divided Democrats and Republicans, entertainment factors, and patronage. Now, in the Gilded Age, and we're not really going to talk about this, but in the Gilded Age, the sequence of presidents is this. Grant is elected to the presidency in 68. He is re-elected to the presidency in 72. Grant is a Republican. Hayes is elected to the presidency in 76. He doesn't seek office in 80. Garfield is elected to the presidency in 80. Garfield and Hayes were both Republicans. Garfield was assassinated by Guiteau. Chester Arthur, a Republican, takes over. Right? He serves out Garfield's term. In 84, and we'll mention this tomorrow to some extent, Cleveland was elected to the presidency. Cleveland was elected to the presidency. Just one word about Cleveland, depending upon what we get to tomorrow. Cleveland is elected to the presidency. He is the first Democrat since Buchanan to be president. Buchanan was elected in 56. There's not a Democrat elected until Cleveland in 84. Cleveland is going to serve with some level of distinction, but he is going to do something that becomes kind of suicidal politically. Cleveland is going to take, for the first, for one of the first and rare times in the period, a stand on an issue. Cleveland is going to come out against high tariffs. So he is going to campaign for the presidency in 88 on a platform of lower tariffs. That costs him the election. He loses to Harrison who is a Republican from Indiana who defeats him. Cleveland runs against Harrison in 92 and defeats him. So he's elected again to the presidency. 
Cleveland is the, you know, Cleveland does not seek re-election in 96. 96 is going to be a contest between William Jennings Bryan and um, McKinley. It's McKinley, William McKinley. Now, over the next two days, we'll highlight those presidents. But that gives you an overview of that. Now, what was the case of Plessy versus Ferguson? What was the case of Plessy versus Ferguson? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Plessy was one-eighth black, and since he was one-eighth black, he had a drop of uh, black blood, and he had to sit in the black barrel of the car. So, so in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, the issue was, what was decided in that case? The constitutionality of, say it. It was like a drop. Well, the one drop rule, yes, but the constitutionality of Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws. And what was the ruling, dear Julia? that they are in fact constitutional, that you can have separate facilities for whites and blacks as long as Coulter they are. The, the Supreme Court decision of Plessy versus Ferguson constitutionalizes Jim Crow laws, says that it's okay to separate blacks and whites as long as the facilities are equal. Separate is okay. Just for fun, what Supreme Court decision overturned Plessy versus Ferguson? Yes. Brown versus the Board. Brown versus the Board of Education. Does anyone, anyone besides Lucas Haley and myself know the date of the Brown case? Year. Yes. 54. 1954. So from 1896 until 1954, there was constitutionally sanctioned segregation in the South. Constitutionally sanctioned segregation in the South in the form of Jim Crow laws. What was the Pendleton Act? We just mentioned it today. What was the Pendleton Act? We just mentioned it today. Yes, go ahead. It made, uh, it made all civil service employees or government employees have to take a competency test. Competitive examinations for the hiring of civil... Remember this about the Pendleton Act, and we'll reinforce this tomorrow. It is the first meaningful piece of legislation passed to regulate the civil service, to regulate the hiring of governmental employees. There will be subsequent pieces of legislation passed, but it's the first time the federal government attempts to, to, to provide some kind of regulation. What is the Pendleton Act a response to? We just talked about this in the eighth period, a second ago. Yes. Garfield being shot. Yes, Garfield's assassination. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Let's go, that takes us up to where we are in class now. Let's review the stuff on the South, right? No, I'm saying the South, on the West. This would be the stuff in Chapter 26. This is material that I'm not going to talk about at all. I mean, tomorrow we're going to talk about you know, when we convene tomorrow, we're going to finish up the Pendleton Act. We're going to talk about Grover Cleveland's election. We're going to talk about his defeat. And we're going to quickly get to something called the Populist Party. And there's going to be a, a fair number of questions on the test about populism. Right? Now, so you're going to read about the Populist Party in Chapter 23. We're going to talk about the Populist Party in in um, in our conversation, and just as a hint for that, in case you know we don't talk about it a lot, the Populist Party is a third party that emerges in the election of 1892 that represents agrarian discontent. Agrarian discontent means unhappy farmers. The Populist Party is going to have a huge impact on the, on the 92 election. Their candidate, James Weaver, is going to win states. They are going to elect congressmen and senators, right? And they reflect unhappy farmers. Now, they are going to fade quickly, but the influence of populism is still felt and is really going to change the dynamics of politics. 
So we're going to talk about them pretty extensively. And the populist and agrarian discontent is talked about in chapter 26 in your book. In chapter 26 in your book, there's a lot of discussion about agrarian discontent. Why were the farmers unhappy? And in just, again, a hint, because we might not get to it as well as we like. The, the source of discontent for farmers was falling farm prices. Farm prices fell. And this made it difficult for them to make it. I hope we don't have a delay to that would kill us. That would not you, me. Right? Um, well, anyways, additionally in chapter 26, there's a discussion about the Trans-Mississippi West. And the discussion in the book kind of looks at the pattern of settlement. People leaving the East to, to migrate to the West. Now, one of the most, I mean, when we look at that, when we, when we romanticize that, we see these towns that emerge and, you know, everything. But one of the most prominent things that happens is a cultural conflict. Most of the Native Americans that had inhabited the East had been pushed west of the Mississippi River. I mean, the last bastion of Indian culture was in the Trans-Mississippi West. Remember the Trail of Tears? Where did those Indians go? I mean, they went to Oklahoma, and eventually from Oklahoma, they went into the Trans-Mississippi West. So there were powerful, well-armed Native American tribes that are going to resist white settlement. And so one of the most distinctive parts of Western settlement is an ongoing conflict between Native Americans who were attempting to kind of protect whatever they had left and Europeans that were coming west in, in, in seeking opportunities. Now, the policy of the U.S. government was to kind of force Native Americans onto Indian reservations. The problem was, too frequently, they would do this and Native Americans would agree to this but there were problems in that Native Americans didn't understand notions of agreements and land and property ownership. And then the federal government would betray them and settlers would go there anyways. And this is the source. I, I, think, I think there was like some ridiculous number of pitched political con or not political conflicts, military conflicts between Native Americans and the U.S. Army. Right? I mean, the U.S. Army is going to battle. The Battle of Little Bighorn, obviously, where George Custard is, is defeated and all of his troops are massacred, is the most famous of those. But eventually, the end of the story is that the Europeans win. Right? Now, two things. One is the Dawes Act. D-A-W-E-S, the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act is the legislation that's passed in 1887 that establishes a relationship between the Native Americans and the federal government. What the Dawes Act, Act attempts to do is to break the tribal unit of the Native Americans, to make Native Americans, individual farmers. The Dawes Act offers to Indians, albeit somewhat inferior land, 160 acres of free land, if they'll become farmers. I mean, really what, what whites try to do with Native Americans is make them like us. Individualistic farmers who own property, cultivate the land, raise their families. The Native Americans are going to resist this. They're going to, you know, they're going to resist religious conversion. They're going to re resist kind of the stipulation of the Dawes Act. But the Dawes Act is going to be the U.S. policy um, between the Indians and the, and, and, and the government until the 1930s without much success. The terrible kind of conflict between the Native Americans and the United States government and the settlers that go there is chronicled in a famous book that, that's influential, that's frequently asked, it's mentioned in your text. It's called A Century of Dishonor. And this book is really critical 
It's written by Helen Hunt Jackson, and it's really critical of the U.S. government's policy towards Native Americans and the relationship between Europeans and Native Americans. Incidentally, despite all the fighting between the Native Americans and the cavalry and the resistance and the, the, and the, the reservations and all of the things that happened, the mutual massacres, I mean, the fighting was vicious, you know, between the you know, whites and Indians and, and, and the, um, in the, uh, on the frontier. One of the things that's interesting, probably the myth is that the Indians were savage and white settlers were civilized. So the Indians would savage their, the, the captives, if they would capture white people, mutilate their bodies and scalp them almost animalistically. But you never really see Europeans behaving that way. Well, that might be something to consider. I mean, were there massacres of Indians by Europeans in a manner that, that we accuse the Indians of doing? You know, it might be something that would unveil the myth. But the century of dishonor is a, is a, is a ground breaking book. But really what hurts the Indians on the plains more than anything is the virtual extermination of the buffalo. There are estimated 15 million buffalo on the plains. By 1900, there's a thousand left. A thousand, right? From 15 million to a thousand. I mean, almost exterminated. And the buffalo for many of the Plains Indians was their entire existence. They used every part of it. They ate it. They used the skins. They everything. Everything with the buffalo was part of what sustained them. Yes. Did they just overhunt them or what? Yeah, and then they killed them for for pleasure. They overhunted them, they killed them for pleasure. The railroads, they could knock over a locomotive. So they could delay the train. So they had bu Buffalo Bill Cody just kill Buffalo. They would just kill them and leave them. Right? You know, they would they would just kill them and exterminate them as a nuisance. I don't think their numbers are as quite uh, low as that today. But I don't know that there's Buffalo herds. There might be. One last thing about the, the, the West. Despite the fact that most think that Western settlement was kind of these frontier towns of excitement and gunfire. Three groups are going to settle the rest, and I'll do them really quickly because I know the hour is late. Miners, ranchers, and farmers. Eventually, the West is conquered by those three groups. Miners, and then eventually large mining concerns, cowboys and ranchers, and then farmers, mainly farmers. And in terms of farms, the, the, um, the legislation that perpetuates farming is the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act will be on the test, and the Homestead Act provided for, for the first time, free land in the West. You, if you were a U.S. citizen, I don't even know if you had to be a U.S. citizen, and you wanted land in the West, if you paid a minimal fee, $30, and, and cultivated it for five years, it was yours for nothing. The Homestead Act is going to encourage Western agrarian settlement. Now, I'm not sure if we mention everything about chapter 6. Well, we mentioned a fair number of things about chapter 26. And we'll try to finish up other things. Yet. But I would read that chapter. I mean, I would read all, of them, all three because I'm a conscientious student. And Shane, I'm sure you agree with reading all three. But I would definitely read 26. It would be helpful. And you kids, I'm hoping that each one of you get an A for attending this session. And the people that don't attend, I hope they get C minuses on the, uh, on the test. All right. That's it for today. That was a lengthy review session, wasn't it? Which one is your own essay?